and gentlemen, to the coffee break conversation of artificial intelligence, a volatile promise of tomorrow. This particular topic has developed into numerous catchphrases by the media, research projects by the academia, and investments by the private sector, with the goal of introducing the understanding of a future of instant decision making done partly or fully by machines. However, what remains unknown are the implications of said future on security and interstate relations. Therefore, making it necessary to approach the idea of machine-generated intelligence through the prism of security of not only states, but also of international organizations, businesses, and civil society. Therefore, today, with the three esteemed panelists, we will give our perspective on these issues and try to look deeper into artificial intelligence and what kind of future does it bring. So firstly, Mr. Joe Burton, Senior Lecturer at the New Zealand Institute for Security and Crime Science, University of Waikato. Welcome. Thank you. Secondly, Mrs. Elaine Lange Yonatamishvili, Senior Expert at NATO Strategic Communication Center of Excellence. Welcome. Hello. And uh, Mr. John Frank, Vice President of EU Governmental Affairs at Microsoft. Welcome. And I will be moderating the uh, discussion. And my name is Edgar Borg, and I'm from Riga Graduate School of Law. Welcome, the viewers, to Coffee Break Conversations. Firstly, let's talk about the volatility and possible promises of artificial intelligence. And what are the currently known possibilities and maybe dangers of intelligence generated or utilized in actions by machines rather than humans? Joe, looking from the perspective of cybersecurity strategy, what could be the implications of artificial intelligence in regards to cyber? Yes, a good question and thanks very much for the invitation to be here. It's a, good, a really good opportunity to talk about AI at the, at the Riga Forum. Um, I think um, AI has tremendous potential in cyber security, uh, but, it, but it has tremendous potential, I think, for both defense and attack. And I think it's um, the sort of offense-defense balance, if you like, in respect of how AI is going to influence cyber security is uh, unresolved. Um, one of the big things about cyber networks is the exponential growth in the data, the Internet of Things. We're talking about the Internet and Internet networks and digital infrastructure now being made up of billions of devices, and that is set to exponentially grow. All these devices are generating exponentially larger volumes of data every year. The vo it's, it's staggering the growth in the volume of data. And of course now we have to apply the AI to that data and that digital infrastructure in order to defend it. Uh, and one of the, the great utilities I think of AI is that how are we possibly going to gain situational awareness in those sorts of cyber networks. We can't do that as individuals, we can't do that as network or systems administrators, we need machines, we need algorithms to figure out what's happening in vast digital uh, networks. So the importance of AI and algorithms in cyber defense is going to be more and more important for that uh, reason. But the flip side of that, and of course, um, as with many of these topics, I think um, we're talking about a double-edged sword, AI is going to make attack vectors and methods potentially uh, more capable. Um, we've already seen examples of uh, adversarial AI, the manipulation of algorithms to impact um, social media. Uh, we're talking about more and more sophisticated uh, malware, um, harvesting social media data to better target intended recipients. So AI is making the malware more sophisticated, more damaging, more targeted, better able to precision target sp uh, specific um, people or, or organizations. Um, and uh, I think ultimately the, the question will be who has you know, the better AI? Uh, and that's probably why we're seeing a sort of arms race in, in AI. It's gonna depend on how good your defensive AI and how good your opponent's adversarial AI is. Um, so I think AI is going to have a huge impact on cybersecurity uh, generally in the coming years, uh, and it's going to be a real battle to keep those vast networks secure from these evolving threats. 
excellent looking at the possibilities and um, implications on uh, of these threats and development of the already existing threat vectors as you point out really creates a creates a similar situation of whose AI is truly better. Mm -hmm. Moving towards a particular aspect mentioned by Joe, the utilities, the looking, of, uh, looking at uh, utilities of artificial intelligence. Elena, maybe you could give us a um, particular look towards uh, the implications on strategic communications or how strategic communications in regards uh, to particular digital aspects um, are currently utilized and maybe impacted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I think uh, that um, as of recent, uh, there is this uh, increased uh, sort of concern and fear uh, in the society at large about how artificial intelligence, uh, you know, machine learning, algorithms, how all of that uh, actually could affect us as citizens without us actually realizing it and knowing it because it is something that um, we don't just like not understand how it works but sometimes we don't even know that it's happening so for example when I place uh, a call on my mobile phone to you I wouldn't be able to explain all the technicalities of how do I get from pressing a button here to your phone ringing there but at least I know what I'm doing I know what it is and what it's for um, and with what you mentioned uh, from the Stratcom uh, perspective, I think now it has led, uh, like what's happened, for example, with the US election, manipulation of voter choices, influencing people's actual real life behavior uh, by using big data. Uh, I think it has led to, um, yeah, erosion of trust. Uh, people are not sure uh, whether uh, actually the government or the state is able to control it, is able to protect the citizens. And I think, um, well, it's, it's not, it, it is a good thing because we should be wary of it and it has actually opened up a lot of uh, debate these days and actually new um, initiatives including legislative changes that are being enforced. Um, to improve the situation and make it more clear for, for the citizens of what is it and how it could be yeah, used um, in, yeah, to influence them. Um, but at the same time, um, there are also a lot of good things that it could be used for. And um, for example, um, we often worry that uh, artificial intelligence will be biased that it will malfunction and therefore some terrible decisions will be made by it uh, that will be very harmful for us. But then if you think about humans, uh, I mean we malfunction sometimes, we are very biased in our decisions. And recently um, uh, I looked at uh, AI program that actually helps large companies to do job interviews, like to do the initial screening of the candidates. Uh, and it doesn't actually just save, uh, you know, resources for the company when they have like thousands of applicants for one place, you know, like in Silicon Valley, the big, big, uh, big <coughs> names. But at the same time, the candidates themselves said that they actually felt better being interviewed by an AI uh, program than by a real human being because they actually thought that this is less biased. Um, they, they thought it's like more fair, but I guess it depends on what you feed into the system and then, you know, uh, how, how, how it then responds, so. Quite an interesting aspect of looking at what do you feed into the system and how it responds. But as we have assessed the, as uh, Joe has uh, prominently said that, um, different attack vectors and as you had said that uh, the information, the lack of trust and uh, understanding of what is happening is co uh, quite muddied at uh, this particular situation. John, I am now moving on to you. How could we approach this particular problem of comprehension of artificial intelligence and how do we kind of clear up the understanding of the multiple facets which this particular problem or, or opportunity can um, have on day-to-day -day lives or operations of businesses or operations of governments? Sure. Artificial intelligence is, on the one hand, it's at the beginning of, of its 
increase in the power of the technology. On the other hand, it is very valuable today. And we're going to see artificial intelligence really spread throughout every aspect of our lives, just as the internet has connected us through every aspect of our lives. Um, but it is important to recognize that these tools can also be used as weapons, uh, and that we need ethical frameworks around it so they ensure that they remain human-centric, we deal with bias, fairness, transparency, um, and, and so that society can not just feel it's in control, but actually impose societal values on the use of the technology. So whether the technology is you know, being used uh, in a business to help the manufacturing process uh, be more precise with fewer errors and, and reduce its carbon footprint, um, or whether it's being used by um, you know, government to, to help deliver services more efficiently, um, it's, it's, a, it's a technique that will be used um, you know, by people that, um, you know, in small ways. You know, it's, it's cumulative, uh, it, it's a way forward to continue to make progress on things that we weren't making progress on before. The uh, why now? Um, you know, people have been, computer scientists have had this dream of artificial intelligence for a lot of years. There's been a lot of very important work done. But more recently, we've seen a dramatic increase in the effectiveness of the research, and we're making more progress. Um, you know, today we've got, um, we do have hyperscale cloud computing available to anybody. And so before you had the capital expense of having to build an expensive data center, have a lot of technical people there to operate it, uh, and uh, you know, the ongoing costs were quite high, so it wasn't ev something everybody could do. Now, um, anybody can get access to the data center. Uh, the algorithm, most of the research takes place in two open source libraries. Uh, that you know, certainly we as a company contribute to and, and work with. Um, and so it's an open innovation framework um, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, we need more people to think about data science and how to use it um, in their existing, if you will, domains of expertise. Um, and so, you know, if you're in the business of, of operating the public transportation system, you know that. Computer scientists aren't going to understand that. But you need to be able to find the collaboration so that you can have the dialogue about, well, how can data science, what, what are the problems you're trying to solve? And let's look at the data sets and see how we can go uh, solve them. Um, Rolls-Royce is a, a customer of ours, um, and they produce these you know, the Trent uh, turbine jet engines. Uh, and they came to us and said, well, we're getting data from all these sensors on these jet engines, but you know, help us figure out what more we could do with it. And so the, the dialogue back and forth, it was, we don't know anything about jet engines, but you know what problems you need to solve or you know, would be valuable to solve. And so the idea of creating a predictive maintenance framework so that you don't have to wait for a part to fail, but you can figure it out in advance. That's it's actually, it's, it's really important, not only for Rolls-Royce and the airlines, but as airline passengers, there's fewer delays. Uh, and they also asked, well, you know, what else would be interesting? They said, well, can we save fuel? Uh, in fact, you know, there is what, you know, there are ways to uh, learn from the data coming from the existing engines about how Rolls-Royce can help airlines save fuel and reduce their carbon footprint. So again, it's, but it's a collaboration process uh, to, to take on challenges where you take your domain expertise that, of what you know and try to figure out in dialogue how do you add more technology in this new area to help solve existing problems. Quite interestingly, focusing on dialogue and creating this com uh, comprehension of what are the problems we're trying to solve and looking at the particular expertise of people who know how to maybe possibly solve these problems. So dialogue, dialogue, and dialogue. Secondly, moving on to understanding how the current status quo um, 
could kind of transform into the idea of a prominent dialogue because currently even though we are looking at possibilities of dialogue, the bottom top approach to cybersecurity uh, and possibly AI, the question arises about how could the best different opera operations could be tailored uh, from within the states themselves or within the governments or within the civil society in order to uh, kind of shift this, un uh, shift this uh, traditional understanding of uh, bottom-top approach of legislative processes and et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, I'm going back to you, Joe. Uh, looking at the shifts uh, in different planning from the aspect of possibly military operations uh, or uh, planning of uh, different foreign policies, how do you sh uh, how do you see the shift would, uh, could be best approached? Yeah, I think it's a really important question, and I, I, we we uh, as international relations academics we talk a lot talk a lot about the state and its changing role and the relationship between the state and the society and the private sector, and of course I think particularly with cyber uh, and with AI, um, uh, collaboration between the state and the private sector is important if we're going to uh, you know, build safe and secure AI and do so responsibly and ethically and so on and so forth. Um, I think what, what I see at the moment is, is um, I think unfortunately we are seeing states competing in this area and trying to grab power in this area. Um, the, the Mr. Putin just across the border um, has said that the leading nation in AI will be the ruler of the world. So I think it's clear that there are governments, including Russia and also China, who view uh, AI dominance and superiority as very important to their national interests in, I think, an increasingly um, uh, unstable international environment. And I think we are seeing uh, a state-led arms race for um, predominance and preeminence in uh, AI. We've, we see evidence of that in um, Chinese strategy as well. China are very much looking to AI uh, as a military tool um, with a view to trying to control the information space, again to serve their national interests for national defense, for um, uh, to complement their sort of area denial military strategies in the South and East China Sea and off their coast. Um, and they see AI as a tool, I think, in those sorts of circumstances to, to try and, um, a, again, achieve sort of dominance in the information space. It's interesting to note that the United States Department of Defense um, last year released its first uh, AI strategy, which seeks to incorporate AI across the US armed forces. So they're very much looking at integrating AI into their military planning and operations and exercises. Um, so, you know, don't get me wrong, society is vitally important, but, but this sort of great power of competition, I think, is occurring with respect to, to AI already. And I think um, some of this sort of comes, I think, um, from how we've viewed AI historically and, and culturally. Uh, people often sort of roll their eyes when, when, I, when I talk about the Terminator films, right? And, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and uh, you know, the, the 2001 A Space Oddity, the AI, HAL in that film, or the alien films, terrifying as those were, with the androids who tried to undermine the human crew of the ship, um, you know, short circuit Johnny Five going mad and, and, and going bad, and these sort of depictions of, of AI as sort of killer robots and things that harm us I think are ultimately affecting how AI is viewed and creating fear around it and creating security uh, dilemmas. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in New I've been in New Zealand for the last 15 years, way, way across in the South Pacific, and we've even had a campaign, quite a strong domestic campaign, to ban killer robots, right? And we've been lobbying at the UN to try and um, halt the proliferation of unmanned aerial vehicles who are using AI to target and to autonom autonomously use force. So even in a country like New Zealand where probably, you know, in all honesty, robots are probably more likely to be used for avocado picking or sheep herding, we're having this uh, debate, right? Um, 
So we do need to do something, I think, about great power competition and the increase, and I'm particularly worried about the increasing use and utility and integration of AI into military affairs and, and sort of algorithmic warfare. And that's not just to um, enhance military capabilities, operations, um, but it's in the information space as well. You know, AI is being used aggressively in the in social media in the information do domain to subvert uh, other countries um, and I think one of the pivotal issues and it comes up time and time again is how we encourage the sort of collaboration you talked about between the state and the military organizations and the intelligence agencies and the big tech companies in trying to stop this kind of ma manipulation and there's all sorts of examples in recent years of how of how challenging that is um, so I, th I do think we need to be concerned about that sort of hard power, cutting edge use of AI and, and need to, f to think about how we might maybe regulate some of this activity internationally in order to overcome some of the risks that that poses. Quite interesting looking at the big power competition and, and the different implications on military operations, offensive use of artificial intelligence, defensive use of mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. but. You also touched upon the importance of the society, of the societal aspect. Now I'm moving to Elian. Elian, looking at the established pro a problem, which you said, how do we know it's real? You call me, I understand it. You, you are the one who's calling me. And uh, looking from the perspective of, let's say, of a Facebook user who is who's, uh, quite understandably seeing a deep fake or, or, or giving uh, different possibilities, thinking that this particular world leader is saying X, Y, or Z. How would you look forwards the development of the media literacy and how could we, how could we also uh, prepare the society in order to kind of understand that some of their decisions, like decisions on YouTube videos or different advertisements on Facebook, how their uh, decisions are maybe impacted by algorithms rather than their own independent choices? Yeah, this is obviously something that's been talked about for years now. Um, and, uh, well, some changes are being implemented uh, gradually. Uh, for example, as far as I know, Finland has already uh, fully implemented a program for primary schools uh, to ensure advancement of media literacy, critical thinking. Um, so, but um, I think it's um, it's something you can look at from two sides. Um, so, one is obviously that there will always be the bad guys who will try to uh, impersonate, manipulate, produce fakes. Uh, but then there are also the good guys, and we shouldn't be forgetting about them. So sadly, the bad guys are usually one step ahead, but, <laughs> um, but the good guys are uh, making it more and more difficult for them to be bad and do what they're doing. So it's about us being prepared. For example, uh, the deep fake uh, videos that are getting more advanced and um, yeah, more real. Uh, there are people who are actually working on programs that would help people to detect that this is a deep fake video. Um, so, um, so I think there, this, this is like an eternal fight uh, throughout humanity. Now we've moved on to social media, deep fakes, AI, but you know, it's nothing new. It's the same thing, you know, the good versus the, the, the evil. I think the question is more about uh, our preparedness as governments, as politicians. For example, we have the U.S. election coming up. I'm not sure how, how ready U.S. is uh, because I think uh, in terms of like facing these deep fakes and, and uh, also um, other kind of like voice impersonations uh, of, of political leaders, we've already seen some cases uh, breaking out. So. Um, so I, I think it's very much about us putting the, the relevant regulation and laws and being aware and actually saying that we are aware because that also has been proven to be a deterrent. I think uh, when uh, coming back to um, the, the foreign interference in elections, I think um, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, why elections, for example, in Sweden, in Finland, also in Latvia, actually went uh, pretty smoothly in, in this regard. The re the one of the reasons was because 
everybody knew that we all were very well prepared. We shared information, uh, we were ready, we had direct links with the uh, uh, social media companies, the big, big giants, so they were on the line. And um, I think that sort of was like a deterrence for the hostile, like bad actors to actually do something. Uh, same, uh, I'm sure you will agree, is with the cybersecurity. So uh, the, the more defended and prepared you are, the, the less likely someone's going to waste their time trying to break your systems because they know it's going to be very hard. Um, <coughs> but uh, coming back to uh, what was said about uh, the other big actors uh, who are closed and authoritarian systems, so I think the problem is that um, they, of course, have uh, access to as much data as they want uh, about their citizens. So they can really train uh, their AI. Uh, we can't really do it because we have regulations in place. Now we have the GDPR, uh, which is great for the citizens and for protecting our basic human rights, including online. But at the same time, it's maybe not so good for the scientists uh, because they don't have a freedom to just get any data that they want, feed into the machine, help it learn, help it improve in advance. So there are always these, uh, these two sides. Um, I think as long as we live in a democracy, uh, we're going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what really um, scares me is things like the social credit system in China, uh, where basically they it, it also shows how much data is actually available to a government and it also shows um, how not evil robots but we as fellow citizens can actually uh, rate each other, uh, give each other scores, report each other and uh, actually make sure that you get a higher or lower score and therefore it has absolute real life implications on whether you get a better job, whether you get a better salary, your kid goes to a better school. Um, so I think um, yeah, in our uh, systems, uh, democratic systems, uh, this partially already exists if you think about it because, you know, uh, mm, there are companies uh, who chase uh, people who have bad debts, right? So there is already certain credit ranking, uh, banks have access to some of that, so et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, the good thing is that it's in silos. So it's sort of need to know basis. So nobody has actually, nobody's the big brother here. Nobody has the access to like everything. And uh, in places like uh, China with the social credit system, it's not like that anymore. And then we have to think um, with the devices uh, that we use, for example, uh, where they are purchased from and what kind of data they have and where they are transmitting this data back to home servers or I don't know. <laughs> um, also about uh, our footprint, for example, uh, when we uh, buy something, uh, just uh, commodities, yeah, or food or whatever. Um, these companies, uh, do we have a regulation of them giving this data back, back home? So if it's like a Chinese company or I don't know, some other company. And then the, the thing is that, yes, they have just a piece of information. But if they have like a lot of little pieces and then back at home they pull them together, they actually could have a lot of information about our society, about our vulnerabilities, uh, etc. So I think this is a very, very scary bit. Can I just add very briefly, I think Alina raised a, r a really important point. The, the, one of the themes of this panel is volatility and whether we're going to actually have a a more volatile international environment because of AI, but of course some countries I think are looking at AI as a tool, not just for geostrategic competition with each other, but for internal control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a tool actually to, to decrease volatility domestically for some countries and to, to again, surveil their citizens. Um, uh, so I think that's a really important point to emphasize. Truly, truly an interesting aspect, and Eileen also touched upon the influence of companies. And um, but looking forwards, and uh, with regards to also mentioned the development of legislation and laws. The beauty about democracies are that democracies are largely based on cooperation, interstate cooperation, and your business cooperation, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
this is where a possible, maybe an antidote could be provided where in, where in regards to big data gatherers, as you already explained, John, uh, such as Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, could provide the, the possibility for cooperation with the democratic governments and give some knowledge and some possibilities how to better legislate this particular topic or how to gain the knowledge in order to develop a comprehensive legislation uh, which can which can be furthered uh, furtherly used uh, to um, protect the democratic system well in fact you know, Brussels the European Union's uh, center of gravity is at the forefront of both thinking th about the ethics of AI but also whether regulation can be smartly done in different aspects there's foundational aspects, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, actually provides uh, more protections um, that are, are very significant in terms of transferring data and how data is used. Um, and they've also, from, a, from the impact they have on organizations, uh, complying with GDPR is requiring organizations to come to grips with the data they hold mm -hmm. and to manage that data better. Uh, which is uh, has a positive aspect and also an opportunity for innovation um, with uh, with the data. Um, if you look across then the range of uses, um, I think it's really hard to come up with horizontal AI legislation. I think you have to think about the particular circumstance in which you want to use it in. And, and uh, let me give you just two. One is in, in health data. Um, Artificial intelligence techniques will be very helpful in treatment of diseases. Um, the cost now of mapping the human genome has come down significantly enough that it will soon be part of the standard test for cancer patients to, to map the mutations uh, that lead to the cancer cells. Um, and, you know, but you build up that data, and, and none of us want to have our uh, medical diagnosis published in the newspaper, but the scientific data aspects um, are something that's quite valuable more generally. Uh, we worked with uh, the Oxford Internet Institute on a project to, to gather together um, medical science, patients, privacy uh, groups to, to talk about, well, what's the right framework for this? And, you know, the patients were the ones who were most militant. They want their data used. Because if, if their data can help somebody else fight this disease, that's a huge positive. So, but you, they want constraints, right? And so we've come up with proposals for data donation. Uh, it's like people donate blood. Well, you can donate your health science data. Uh, and, and, and in healthcare, some regulation around data sets and how this can work can be a very positive foundation for further medical research. So that's, 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 I think, a very positive case. Another case is facial recognition technology. Um, it has very positive uses. You know, uh, my Windows 10 laptop recognizes my face. It's a much more secure way of verifying that I'm the, I'm the user uh, than typing a password, which can be compromised. Um, and, you know, there's, that's a very positive use. Um, the social credit system, uh, you know, at least, I don't know if it's, it's true or not, but the joke at least is that in China, if you're going to jaywalk, by the time you get across the street, uh, the fine's been deducted from your, from your account <laughs> on your phone, right? Um, and that, that, to Westerners, that feels like kind of creepy, right? That just, um, you know, I probably jaywalk more than I should, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, but the facial recognition technology can be applied across a whole range of things. And certainly, there is a regulatory framework uh, in Europe about how police can use it, um, and there's less regulation about how it can be used commercially, because it was never, yeah, in the police context, it can build on the, the domain expertise of surveillance cameras. Uh, in commercial sense, you know, stores want to have it to, to see if customers like new products by their reactions. So the positive things, or stadiums want to be able to keep hooligans from coming back. Um, so there's, um, 
So we think that it's a good area, though, to look at because it can be abused in anti-democratic ways or in ways that are invasive of privacy to have more specific rules. And one of them is providers like ours should provide more information. Uh, it's not just the people using the technology, but you know, when I, when I get a prescription uh, at the pharmacy, there's a little sheet inside with disclosures. Uh, when you get at AI technology, um, you're, not, you're not being told that you know, it's less accurate on women than it is for men. It's less accurate for people with darker skin than lighter skin. Um, and, and so it, you know, users of the technology, we need to give them well-informed information so that they can make smart choices about what's an appropriate use and what's an inappropriate use. Um, you can't, uh, for example, you know, the police in some cities use where these body cams, and it's very helpful to increase transparency and accountability. Um, but the camera quality isn't high enough to do real-time facial recognition. And it's very important to put a human check on that system. Um, and, and so we can work it out, the new scenarios, but we do need some regulation. And I think that um, Brussels is actually a very good place to make progress on. Excellent. Can I, can I come yes, in on this? of course. Um, there is also like a lot of conversation about uh, social media platforms, like how they should be cooperating uh, with the governments, uh, you know, with organizations like European um, uh, Commission, and you know, impose stricter rules, self-control, blah blah blah, share the data. Um, at the same time, I think what we are forgetting here is that uh, these are businesses. So it's not like uh, a charity organization. Uh, the, the, the prime motivator is to develop the business and actually earn money. Uh, it's as simple as that. So this is something we have to take into consideration when we have these very high expectations that now, you know, Facebook is going to like just give all their commercial secrets of how their algorithms operate to us. You know, they're just gonna uh, follow the lead uh, and, and the requirements of a government or, or, or EU or whatever. Um, you know, it, it's unrealistic to expect that and it's not even fair to expect that, you know. Uh, so I think uh, there definitely has to be a dialogue and I think uh, companies, um, uh, are very well aware of what kind of damage uh, uh, this kind of yeah uh, situations can do to their reputation. So there is an incentive, uh, of course, to cooperate, and it is happening. But at the same time, I think we have to be very realistic. And if we really want uh, to have something from such companies, we have to give them uh, business-oriented incentives, money incentives. So this is how we should be thinking about it, I think. Assessing the possibilities of cooperation definitely requires a multifaceted approach. Uh, of course, the initiative to provide better opportunities for the consumers is an in interest of businesses, but also from the aspect of the civil society and governments, they should look towards the kind of most positive incentives for the businesses themselves. Excellently. But John, you touched upon quite an interesting aspect of a well-informed user. And this can make uh, or give the floor for the possibility to assess the possible implications on decision making. The decision making of both governments, uh, <laughs> leading NGOs, international organizations. And um, this time, let's start with you. Let's re return. Sure. Uh, let's return to you, and uh, let's 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 talk about how could uh, how could this decision making uh, could be impacted or uh, by AI, and what kind of things should be also thought about uh, during the decision making process of. Uh, international organizations, states, uh, businesses. How do we? Uh, still uh, keep in mind the possibility of artificial intelligence and ethics, of still utilizing the aspect of man in the middle, where there's a human check to different decisions, 
And uh, or do we maybe um, in the future move towards a fully automated system into, let's say, maybe smaller tasks, whereas bigger tasks are, are thought of? Where, where do we see the threshold uh, for utilization of AI in decision-making processes? Uh, I, I, it's critical that in each scenario it be human-centered. Now, the scenarios will, will differ widely. Uh, and sometimes AI is being used to kind of do very quickly things that humans could do. So we have a company we work with in Switzerland that has used AI to pick out the defective grains and, and contaminants uh, in uh, a conveyor belt of, of grain going by. And it goes by very fast and it can look at each grain with intelligence that a human has, but not at that speed, and be very, very accurate about it. Um, and so that's something where you're extending human capabilities, um, and but accelerating it. And you know, let's face it, picking out pebbles or defective grains is not really a great job anyway. So um, <laughs> you know, it's it's a it's a it's a win-win for everybody on this. Um, look, there's other complex tasks where. You, you do want to make sure that there's a human, human-centered approach as you design the process, and so certainly in military applications, um, you know, there's there has to be very careful thought to how the human factor is put at the center, so that you can, you know, and and the military, they know they need to comply with the principles of international law. Uh, and they want weapon systems. They want weapon systems that will enable them to do that. Um, so, as you develop the process behind it, you need to bake in the, you know, the capacity for human control. Uh, so, it's a wide variety of things. But for each scenario, I'd say you start with the question of, you know, how are you going to augment the person uh, and put the human at the center of the AI project. Um, you know, so, some of the, uh, uh, a simple kind of description of artificial intelligence is, you know, it's augmenting, it's how do you teach a machine to not just, like a camera can capture an image, but the human, we recognize what that is. And how do you teach a computer to not just see an image, but to understand what it is? And that's, that's a process that's, you know, that's uh, because of, you know, the algorithms and, you know, the development of data sciences is getting better and better. And so uh, a wonderful application um, on smartphones is called Seeing AI. And so for persons who are sight impaired, um, you know, they can use their camera and they'll get, a, they'll get a verbal report of kind of what's around them. And so, you know, the, the camera is getting get an additional intelligence to augment the human capabilities. So there's very positive aspects of, what, of how we use this, um, but human-centered, ethical approaches are essential. Excellent. Now, Eileen, looking at uh, the possibilities, but maybe not so much on the decision-making of individuals, but um, as you have previously excellently mentioned, uh, the impact of uh, Russian propaganda within the 2016 elections, uh, the, the impact of Russia Today and Sputnik News and et cetera, how would you say that um, the look forwards uh, could be maintained in, in with the mind that other governments would be interested in impeding upon the decision making of state institutions or international organizations, do we develop uh, a legislation which requires us to look a bit deeper into information that we are gathering, or, or how do we, how, how do we uh, proceed with keeping also in mind that not only we have to think about uh, how we make decisions, but how others try to impede upon or uh, opportunities to make particular decisions? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. <laughs> it's a very, very, very complex one. And I think uh, 
There's been already like a lot of discussion uh, on this topic, so I would hate to be um, uh, repetitive <laughs> uh, on this. But I think uh, the core here is that we just have to stick by our principles and our values and who we are. And this is something that is and always will lead our legislation. Uh, we live in democratic systems which are transparent and therefore also more vulnerable and predictable, but that, that is also our strength. Uh, so we just have to use uh, the strength uh, parts of that system. I'm not uh, a legal expert. Uh, I cannot answer uh, this question uh, uh, in detail. Um, but I think um, the 2014 um, um, uh, events in Ukraine were a big eye-opener uh, for everybody in this regard in, in the Western uh, democratic world. And I think we've already seen a lot of improvement, a lot of change, including uh, what you will, were alluding to, uh, the, the awareness also uh, in the society at large. Uh, people understand now that they can be manipulated. People understand that, uh, you know, AI or whatever, uh, they call it, can be used uh, to actually drive them to behaviors without them realizing it. And I think that in this case, this fear is a good thing. Fear is a good thing. <laughs> uh, because it motivates people. It motivates people to act. It motivates people to learn more, to understand more, um, to talk about it. It's a good thing, I believe. Fear creates precaution, and the precaution yeah. creates media literacy and understanding of the particular topics. I think you answered that excellently. But, but I think that also from pol politicians' point of view, um, sometimes people are afraid to talk about these issues because they don't feel that they have all the expertise in digital, cyber, whatever. Uh, but I think that um, what everyone's sort of saying here, uh, it's not about the technicalities. Uh, of things that that is the solutions part of it, mm -hmm. but the the point there is what is our stance uh, on, on these issues? Where where do we hold our values? Um, and then I think uh, from our point of view, um, I can't imagine uh, apart from this grain picking and sorting, uh, I can't really imagine uh, uh, a democratic government saying, yeah, I'm going to let now AI run my parliament because, you know, there are a lot of boring laws to get through <laughs> and, you know, we've done this before, so let the AI do it, you know. I, I just can't see that happening, so. They might do a better job sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, that, but actually, fair enough, because yeah. like uh, in China, they also use, uh, for example, this facial recognition system that works with children in a classroom. So they try to assess the mood of each child. Are they happy? Are they sad? They try to assess how engaged they are. And so, you know, the intent is very good because it helps the teacher, it helps the kids potentially, because you can maybe, you know, if, if somebody is very bored or very sad or can't concentrate then you know who that is who struggles constantly and you can try to help them but then again you can also use this kind of system to get rid of such kids and then if you think about you know Albert Einstein who didn't do very well at school right as we all know so he'd be probably expelled out of class never could be could achieve the things that he achieved for the science and for the good of humanity so there always has to be the human decision-making an algorithm in itself is not evil you know like this chair is not evil mm -hmm. I can sit on it and be nice and talk to you or I can take it and you know punch you with this chair right it's the same thing with technology it's about the intent that's there intent. Uh, truly keeping our minds sharp and our values close and let's hope that, that chair doesn't get thrown <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, looking at the decision-making aspect and uh, as uh, John already uh, alluded to in military operations and the decisions make uh, decision making and response and action uh, where do you see from the cyber defense aspect the AI's impact on decision making yes yeah, it's, it's a really important question and I think um, the, the comments um, about sort of um, how decisions are made in the corporate sector and and I think I think it is important to um, 
to make decisions about protection of those sorts of networks on, on the basis of, of, of commercial considerations, but we do also need to appreciate that the Microsofts of the world and the Facebooks of the world are now, whether they like it or not, involved in national security. So there has to be a balance between um, those things. And I think the, um, the argument about reputational costs, I mean, it comes up, I, I often come across that in re reference to the Sony hack in 2014, where there was a drop in the price of the Sony US pictures as a result of the, 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 the controversy over the re release of, of the film The Interview, but you know, the, the reputational cost, it might have been a short-term cost to Sony in terms of the stock market, but the, the price of the company quickly recovered. So I think we need to, I think we need to question and, 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 and I think be maybe a, a little bit cynical about reputational cost as being a factor in changing uh, uh, business models. But back to decision making, I mean, I think, I think it's a really important issue and I think I agree with, with um, largely with what John says. I think we need to think about it, particularly in the military strategic area, as a spectrum of decision making. Um, what is the most destructive thing nations can do? Probably fire nuclear missiles. We're never going to have AI deciding to launch nuclear missiles or used in missile defense at that hard end of the military spectrum. Humans will always be in the loop with those sorts of decisions and that's why the fears about the sort of the, the, um, the, the singularity and the Terminator films is probably misplaced. Similarly with drone warfare, I think it would be very difficult for any military organization in the planet to delegate the decision to use lethal force against someone um, to a machine without there being a human in the loop. So at the harder end of the spectrum, I think um, um, humans will also, will I think always be involved. But as John said, in perhaps the softer end of the spectrum, maybe not so much. And maybe that's where we can delegate more to machines. If we look at it again in the military context, logistics, maintenance, uh, training, these sorts of softer military functions, maybe we will see AI taking a more a prominent and sort of proactive role. Um, I, I remember going to the New Zealand, uh, Royal New Zealand Navy uh, uh, naval base in Devonport in Auckland and they were using VR headsets to train their engineers to, to do repairs on the ships and you know if computers can do those things much more effectively um, than humans then why not delegate the deci decisions to them. Um, so I think we need to look at it as, it as a spectrum. The other point I'd make about decision making is it's not necessarily delegating decision making to AI, it's using the situational awareness that AI provides to improve decision making. So it's not going to be the computers making the decisions, it's military commanders making decisions on the basis of the, in, the, the more sort of 360 vision information that the AI um, can provide. Um, so it's, the, it's that benefit that will inform the decision making and it's not necessarily AI algorithms that are going to be making um, the decisions. Um, you mentioned also concerns about sort of sa safety or the dangers of... of yes, the, the possible dangers of artificial intelligence within use of military operations, yeah. looking at maybe the possibility of uh, information that cannot be used uh, within the data sets or the models that are created that cannot yeah. be applied into the real life situations. Yeah, well I think it comes back to you know, some of these issues have already, already been mentioned, you know, you have to be able to trust the data that you're using to inform your decision making and as we know in the cyber security sphere data can be interfered with, it can be manipulated and if you're making a decision on the basis of corrupted data or uh, data that's, that doesn't have the integrity that you would want it to have then that can um, cause serious uh, uh, um, consequences as well. We also mentioned things like bias, um, there's various examples of, of um, algorithmic systems developing the same sorts of biases as, 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 as humans, so we need to figure out ways to eliminate that. And, and there's, a, you know, there's a broader debate about whether AI will ever be sort of uh, intelligent enough so it's sort of commensurate with the human mind or whether AI becomes perhaps even more intelligent than humans. Well, I think we need to recognise that humans are fundamentally flawed. We are biased. We are... Um, you know, we, we have psychological frailties, we make decisions on the basis of fear, so why would we necessarily expect AI systems that we're creating to be devoid of, of those kinds of qualities? So, yeah, trust, integrity, integrity bias, I think these are all uh, critical things in terms of 
the safety of AI, and that applies to cyber defense and, and other fields as well. Now that is leading us to the last question of this beautiful conversation. And um, turning again to you, John. As we have heard the possibilities of biases, the necessity to keep our values close, our minds sharp, and the inevit inevitable aspect of human error. Looking towards the future, the conversation will be differentiated, maybe even different from the one that we have today. But looking at these maybe keywords or key ideas, what should be looked out for in regards to have a comprehensive, not too technical as we have already said, but still a very valuable discussion about artificial intelligence and its impact on our society, governments, and businesses? I think um, I'll be repetitive with going back. It is, it is, you know, we through our democratic processes get to set our, our legal framework and how we want our society to operate. And, you know, it is sort of a, you know, it's the obligation on the democratic process to produce rules that channel the, the application of technologies in positive ways and prohibit and discourage the misapplication. But it is, um, you know, there is this problem where th if you're using existing data and your existing world is biased, you'll end up just perpetuating the bias. So um, I think it was widely reported Amazon was using an artificial intelligence program to scan resumes uh, that came in and select the top candidates. Well, all the top candidates turned out to be male. And they went back and said, well, why is this? Well, the data they trained it with was their existing population which was very heavily male. And we need to just, you know, and so we need to be aware that there's a risk of bad decisions from incomplete data or just, you know, this is not a perfect science. I mean, the, the word artificial intelligence seems to imply that this is wise. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's, it's statistical. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it can be brilliant statistically, but uh, maybe not, um, you know, it's not, it's not to be trusted by itself. And it's the providers, the people who are applying it, need to be thoughtful, recognize the transparency of it, the, you know, the fairness um, and accountability, um, that those are really going to be bedrock principles that we're going to continue to live with. Um, because the entire point is to have this augment our capabilities and not do a disservice to us in society. Thank you, John. So. And we'll see you on the next panel. Great. Thanks Thank so you much. very much for the conversation. Moving forward. A similar question uh, can be posed to you, Eileen. Uh, as you excellently touched upon uh, the aspect of the aspect of values and, and keeping our minds sharp, the aspect and understanding of Removing the, pos uh, removing the possibility and uh, the influence of disinformation in regards to decision making or day-to-day -day pra practices. How could we structure this particular uh, discussion around these values and uh, how do we move forward? Um, yeah, I think um at the end of the day, um, it all comes down to um, how much of privacy and sovereignty, uh, but sovereignty meaning like as an individual, uh, we're actually ready to give up or compromise on for the sake of convenience. Um, just as an example, uh, for example, the location services on your mobile phone, right? Um, there's been so much talk about it, how this data, this information can be misused, how you can be targeted because you've had your location services enabled when you took a picture and posted it online, blah, 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 blah. 
So, and then the thing is, you know, I uh, personally always try to have my location services disabled. And then you need to use Google Maps, then you need to look up, you know, you're in a urgent situation, you need to find out where's the nearest pharmacy, something like that. And, you know, oh, you have your, lo your location services off. Well, I can't help you then, you know. And it's, um, so this is just one small example, but I think largely it is about, because we as humans, we're inherently lazy. I, I think everyone knows <laughs> that by now. Um, and, and we like convenience, you know. Actually, if you look at our, uh, you know, technological and other progress, it is all about making our lives easier, making our lives more comfortable. Uh, and then the question is, um, how far are we willing to go uh, with the sacrifices? And very often, often um, as Joe will uh, testify, I'm sure, uh, people also compromise on uh, basic cyber hygiene, basic cyber security, just for the convenience. I mean, why should I remember 100 different complicated, at least 11 character long passwords? I mean, I have my little password, which is the same for all my accounts. I'm not talking about myself, by the <laughs> way, now, but, but and, and this is it, you know, it's just laziness, comfort, so we compromise, we give up things. Um, how many of us actually read, like now we have the GDPR, oh, that's very helpful for an ordinary citizen, right? That's going to really protect me now. So whenever I want to go and just read the news on some portal, they give me this huge text in, in, in small letters and at the end of the day, after I read it, all I can click is OK. <laughs> you see what I mean? I've yeah. come uh, across very few occasions where I'm actually given a choice to adjust the settings and to say, no, I don't want you to collect this data and no, I don't allow you to use my data for this purpose. Mostly it's just click OK and then it's your choice. What do you do? And again, when you're in a hurry or you're like really needing some information or, or whatever, you just compromise. You just, you know, go ahead and do it. And a lot of the time you don't even understand what you're doing. So, you know, we, we may say, yes, there has to be dialogue. We have to have this legislation, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, a lot of the time uh, it will all depend on the goodwill of the tech companies who actually have our data um, of our fellow citizens, of the politicians, just depend on their goodwill, basically. That's what I think. So moving away from compromises in order to establish conveniency and keeping our, keeping our understanding about what we agree to on, on site and structuring the conversation around maybe thinking before doing in regards especially to information communication t systems as you also alluded to, uh, cyber hygiene, also media literacy about understanding how we utilize the convenient mm -hmm. processes which we have but still keeping in mind that there is always a cost for conveniency. Exactly. So now moving on to you Joe. Conveniency and uh, and and uh, looking at the possible also ways of deterrence, uh, the 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 structuring of 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 discussion around attribution, maybe about yeah. instant response. How could we look also at artificial intelligence from the perspective of uh, strategic planning, of of foreign policy and uh, aspects like these? Yeah, some really b big issues um, there. I'm not sure we're going to be able to cover th cover those all topics in time. And I think uh, uh, just again to go back to something Alina said that's I think very important is fundamental to this is is um, behaviour, um, human behaviour and individual behaviour. Look, at, if you look at the the subversion of the U.S. election, the hacking of the DNC servers, that was someone clicking on a link in an email. How do we change people's behaviour so that they think before they do that? And this comes back to something I talk about a lot, which is um, we need, um, particularly as a, from the perspective of a researcher, we need to look at this mul in a multidisciplinary way. So we need to understand the politics of AI and cyber, we need to understand the psychology of it, uh, we need to understand the economics uh, of it. If you look at terrorism as a phenomenon, um, why do terrorists commit violent acts? They do so because of politics, they do so because of psychology, they do so because of economic disenfranchisement, maybe. 
So having a holistic understanding that brings people together from different academic disciplines, I think, is really important. And I've been working with um, with some colleagues in the in the psychology behavioural science uh, field, and, and and I think bringing that that beha those behavioural things into AI and cyber defence is is absolutely crucial. Um, and and I think that's really important. Um, deterrence, uh, cyber deterrence, there's been a quite a big literature emerge on cyber deterrence in the last uh, 10 years. Um, there's, I don't think, been almost anything written that I'm aware of on what can AI deter. So if you have, if, if you have a particularly sophisticated uh, AI-based cyber defence or military defence, is that going to deter an attack? I'm quite sceptical of that because um, cyber deterrence is a very difficult thing to achieve. You can't do a retaliatory cyber attack um, if you can't attribute the cyber attack. You ca it's very difficult to escalate because then you're moving from a cyber attack to a potential military use of force and that's not proportional under international law. So there are all sorts of problems with the cyber deterrence framework which I suspect apply to AI as well, um, but this is I think going to be a really important piece of research that, that um, maybe needs to be done. Um, on the attribution question, um, it's um, something that Microsoft actually has proposed is to have a Geneva Convention for cyber attacks, right, to prohibit cyber attacks particularly against civilian uh, infrastructure. Now, of course, one of the problems with that, and, and I think that this is a, a good idea and it gets us to debate in t about international, whether existing international law applies to cyber attacks or whether we need new legal frameworks. I'm somewhat in the latter camp. I think we need to bring a specificity to these problems that existing international law doesn't at the moment provide. But maybe for attribution, what we need to do, whether it's adversarial AI or cyber, is actually create a new institution internationally that can more accurately and um, with with less controversy attribute cyber attacks. An international attribution agency with judges doing the attribution based on evidence provided to them by technical experts rather than attribution actually coming from the intelligence agencies or national security agencies because unfortunately um, those are agencies rightly or wrongly don't um, engender a lot of trust from the public anymore. So. I think we need to look at these new frameworks, new institutions, new laws, and that's the way we're going to be safe from, from these sorts of threats. Thank you very much. It makes it possible to conclude that this particular matter is still in the position of creating questions rather than completely answering them. However, as we have already established, that we should always keep our minds vigilant and um, do not sacrifice our own privacy or possibilities for the sake of conveniency. Keep in mind the ethics and values that we represent as a society and also apply that to artificial intelligence and information communication technologies and therefore creating a society which thinks before it does and uh, creating possibilities to use it as an aspect to use as a tool for future possibilities and improvements. I want to thank you both and also John for participating in this excellent conversation and uh, I want to thank you, uh, thank the viewers for participating and uh, watching the stream and uh, we will uh, continue with the main panel downstairs in Latvia National Library. Thank you. Thank you.